as I was preparing the message, I bless the Lord for the message, first of all, of course, and um, delighted to find a passage that Pastor Warner used to refer to um, frequently, and he, he paraphrased it to where I couldn't search for it and find it, <laughs> but I finally found it, um, and it's going to be, we're going to read near it, but just so I don't miss it tonight, chapter 58 of Isaiah, you don't have to turn there, I'll read it, cry aloud, this is for the preachers. Pastors, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. God's direction to his pastors and elders is to make sin so painfully clear, you just know that's, that's all you are. It's a sinner, and it's a great place to be found in this life. <laughs> this is when you want to find out that you're a sinner, now, not the next life. Oh, that's the concern of your pastor's heart that uh, that everybody here come to saving awareness in, in within your lifetime. Of course, we're not promised tomorrow, so you might want to listen up if you don't know if you know. Um, Titus 3, when I studied this, my the Lord put on my heart, verse 5, to preach. But it blew my mind when I saw Paul's passion to teach good works right in this same area of the scriptures. Chapter 3 of Titus reads, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities, to powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves... Also, we're sometimes, uh, I need a different word there for me, all the time, foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing and regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou after, that thou will affirm con constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works, these things are good and profitable unto men. So Paul is preaching here, teaching here in this passage that you can't divorce good works from a true new heart. When a person's truly resting on Christ's righteousness, we desire and we press towards good works, not to justify us, that's the fall. But because we're justified, these good works are a passion, a desire, and a target every day. May it be I honor Christ in everything I do, say, and think. Verse 9, but avoid foolish questions, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted, sinneth, being condemned of himself. So Paul teaching, you correct somebody godly in a godly way, and they reject it, they condemn themselves if they reject that correction. That's important to put in perspective. It's their problem. Not, not When Nathan corrected David, Nathan knew when he went to David, but David rejects this correction. That's David's problem. God gave me the words to give to David to correct him, coming from Nathan's perspective. David rejected, that's David's problem, not mine. If I don't correct him, that's my problem. God's given me light to see David's sin. I'm to go. But these are some precious things that Paul teaches and preaches through. But verse 5 is just uh, the outline. Point 1 is not by works of righteousness, which we have done. And point 2 in the outline this evening is, but according to his mercy, he saved us. And verse 7 is the, um, is the title. Look in your text here, verse 7, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life everlasting life that justified by God's grace God's grace look at those two words together in the title 
God is the only one that owns the word grace. God's grace defines our God. He's the one that, for no reason in you, sent his dear son to die on your behalf, if you're ever to know him savingly, and gives you a new heart in your lifetime to see that that transaction took place for your benefit. That's grace. That's unearned favor. And God owns it, and God owns it alone. Man can't contribute to salvation. God alone gives it by grace, by grace, by grace, by grace. The use of the message is going to be, and I can't help but start at the end. i got to start this message at the end. Uh, renewing of the Holy Ghost. That word renewing, that's in Titus 3.5 uh, also. That word renewing in the Greek language has two base words. That renew, renewing of the Holy Ghost is a reversal and a newness. So when he says you're renewed of the Holy Ghost, that Holy Ghost was stripped of you when Adam sinned. Adam and Eve, created by God Almighty, breathed life right into him, breathed the Holy Spirit into him that same moment. They were alive and spiritually alive. When they fell, that Holy Spirit was stripped of them, and it was stripped of you also. When you fell, you fell to the lie of Satan's message, hating God, and that Holy Spirit was stripped of you. But by grace, he puts that spirit back within his people. And you're renewed. There's a reversal, a newness that's so fresh and new and restored, godly, you can't lose it. And you'll never lose it. <clears throat> when their eyes were opened in the garden, you imagine that. They sinned heinously. God said, you do these things, you'll die in your sin. Satan's message was more appealing. They wanted to be a ruler of their own destiny. They wanted to dominate God and be over God. They rebelled. Adam rebelled against God, said, I want to be my own God. He was disobedient. Their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened. The Holy Spirit was stripped of them. When that Holy Spirit was stripped of them, all they could do, make fig leaves, iniquity. Start covering their wicked sin with false coverings, iniquitous works, trying to do something good to hide the bad. That's all man has done ever since. That's what every one of us are born in, the iniquity of the fall. And that's all we can do until God break us of that, wake us up to it, actually show us what it is, and we actually grasp that what true sin is. <clears throat> when we're ignorant of God's righteousness, we just go about to establish our own. We list up things that we want to do to try to justify ourselves before God, and we go about to do them. God doesn't care what we do. You can't justify yourself. <clears throat> but God puts back within his people that Holy Spirit that was lost in the fall, and he restores that Holy Spirit based on one attribute of his Son, his blood. The blood of Christ is the life of Christ. And that life of Christ was squeezed out of him and poured out of him on the cross of Calvary. And he died. He laid down his life and he gave it all. He substitutionarily died, even though he's perfect and righteous. He still poured out his life on that cross, gave his life for his people specifically. Not for anybody, not for all, but for the very elect of God the Father that fell in Adam. Those few that fell in Adam that come to know it in our lifetime were restored based on the blood of Christ being shed for us on the cross of Calvary. And that restoration in your lifetime is the Holy Spirit put back in. To hear this message, you get new ears. To see Christ died for you, you get new eyes. And your heart, inner conscience, I'm resting on the blood of Christ alone. This is the Spirit of God that's been restored unto you fully. You're fully restored if these things you embrace and you see and you know. Those of us that have been restored, we went through a heck of a time. We bawled and cried for mercy. That's the introduction. Anybody that doesn't know whether they're saved, I plead with you. Cry unto this God for mercy. When I was a little kid, we played a game that had mercy in it. It was called Uncle. 
we stand face to face, we clasp hands, and we twist and twist each other's hands until the strongest one dominated the other. And the weaker one, which I always was, I was an 80-pound weakling when I was a freshman, I got all wrapped up and I had to say, mercy, because that overpowered me utterly. This is what happened in the fall. We are wrapped up in the pain of the fall and the fear of torment and hell and destruction. We're wrapped up and we can do nothing but sin and iniquity. Try to justify our sin in our lifetime with our foolishness that says there's no God watching me. I'll do what I want where I want. He doesn't have eyes seeing everything. He doesn't watch me. He does. He sees and knows everything. Every thought in your head. Every thought in your head. You do good works to try to justify yourself for the bad. Try to counter the bad in your life. God calls that iniquity. You're a fool saying there's no God. Then when you do sin and you think you can do a good work to counter it, you're full of iniquity. You're full of hate for God. And you're trying to justify yourself based on your own works. God doesn't accept it. That's the, you're in the snare of Satan. Your arms twisted up and you, you need to cry for mercy. There's no way out of being good in this life. God doesn't accept it. All you have is sin that you've inherited from Adam. And you're wrapped up in it. Your very best is a wicked wretch. This is what it is to find out that you're wrapped up in sin and you got to cry. By God's grace, cry unto him for mercy. The first point this evening is that don't do this crying to think you're going to justify yourself. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Paul preaches in here so beautifully. He says, be moral and ethical. Strive to do good with all people all the time. And if you do, that's mercy and grace. And salvation in itself, in a nutshell, is in five. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. That's ridiculous. Turn to Isaiah 64. Isaiah chapter 64. <clears throat> Verse 6 is the classic verse, but we, we are all as the unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses, the, the good thing, the very best of your best days, your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. Our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. We fell in Adam. And there is none that calleth upon the, thy name, O Lord that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, our Father, we are the clay and thou art the potter and we're all the work of thy hand. This is a person that sees they're wrapped up in sin. Satan, the stronger ones, got their arm twisted down tight they can't do anything good enough to justify themselves before God. There's no way they can. They believe the words that say their best day is filthy rags, which means in the original language, death. It's the woman's menstrual cloth, filthy rag. It's death. The very best man offers to God Almighty in our lifetime stinks and is putrefaction before a thrice holy God. Why would you think you can be a good person to justify yourself? God won't accept you. Matthew 5. Turn to Matthew 5 next, please. <clears throat> there was a lot of religious people in Jesus' day when he was preaching the gospel to them. And those religious people had ceremonies. Uh, the Jews mostly had ceremonies where they washed pots a certain way and had to drip dry them just right, all according to these ceremonies. They did everything perfect. And the multitude knew that those are the ones that are the best of the best of all humanity. If anybody was going to work their way to heaven, those are the select guys right over there that had it all figured out, did everything according to the law. Matthew 5.20, For I say unto you, this is Christ, 
that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Took the wind right out of the people that weren't even religious. People that were just common folks heard this, said, well, that those religious good people can't get to heaven through their good works. We're all doomed. You're, you're right. You're right. Verse 21, ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But Christ says unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. Wow, Christ took this sin to a whole new level. And his, when he was here during his earthly ministry, he redefined guilt. He redefined sin. People were living on the edge, doing one thing in their mind and then another thing outwardly and thinking, I'm okay, I'm hiding it. Verse 27 nails it for most men. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. Of course, they stoned those that were found in adultery immediately. Verse 28, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. You're guilty of adultery if you ever lust after a woman. There's no hope inside man. There's not one bit of ability inside man whatsoever to justify ourselves before God. Why would you rest on your morals to justify yourself? The children of Israel went through this generation after generation. They get a leader that set up idols, and those idols would be, they consume them. And then they'd end up being prisoners to their enemies. And then the children of Israel would cry unto God Almighty, we're wrapped up. We see it now. We're full of idolatry. Let's look at a passage in Judges about this. Judges chapter 10. <clears throat> they went through that all the time, didn't they? Generation after generation. Sought after the idols of the, of the civilizations around them, and then they'd bend up prisoners to them. That's that's getting all wrapped up in sin. Judges chapter 10 and verse 14. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. This is God Almighty mocking them. You, you, you'd rather be with idols. You'd rather be with a Jesus that's got a false definition according to the true interpretation of scriptures. What's he going to do in the day of your judgment? Not one thing. It's a figment of your imagination and the false preachers that tell you about him. That God's going to do nothing for you when the true God stands before you and say, i got to have righteous blood or you're damned. Verse 15, And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, The only thing you should say, We've sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. You talk about 100% submission. You talk about 100% guilt. You 100% cry for mercy. If you cast me into hell, God, that's right. If that seems good to you, then you ought to do it. You ought to do it. It's good unto you. Deliver us up. Deliver us only. We pray thee this day. And they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord. This is, this is true repentance for a person to see. God, you throw me into hell. You're right and just if you judge me and throw me into hell. But would you be merciful? I'm just crying unto you day and night. Be merciful to me. You're the, you own mercy. You own grace. Would you give it to me? There's nowhere else to go. And that's point number two. Salvation is according to His mercy. He saves us by grace through mercy. Mercy is the very peak of grace. The very pentium of unearned favor is that He has mercy on you and shows you that. The very definition of God is I'll have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Matthew 9, please. Turn to Matthew 9. Now Jesus went about teaching and preaching to people that had needs. Not, not to the self-righteous. He went to people that were what we would call trailer trash nowadays. The, the off-scours, the, the ones that are wicked, the ones that the world rejects. Matthew 9, 10. 
And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw it, these are the religious folk, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? They don't, they don't know mercy, grace. They don't know sin. They don't know what it is to cry for mercy. Verse 12, Jesus heard that. He said unto them, They that be of whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Christ is saying, The things you do in your life that you sacrifice to be a religious person, I don't accept them. But mercy, mercy, you start begging for mercy, you start crying for mercy, you talk about needing mercy, and all you are is sin, that is, that's godly. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Sinners. The sinners is who Christ calls to show what mercy is. Anybody that's a sinner has no ability in and of themselves. God shows also that you're safe in the blood of Christ. And that magnifies mercy. Because those that are 100% God-haters fit perfect with 100% righteous, the Lord Jesus Christ. But those that are tied up in sin need to cry for mercy. See it in Isaiah 58 with me. Isaiah 58. Last passage we're going to turn to tonight. This is the one where the Lord excited me that I should remind you of your sin. And by God's grace, I think he's done that through me tonight. Isaiah 58 and verse 8 is where I'd like to read. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning. This is what happens in the middle of your cry. When you're all tied up in sin, the very best that you do, you know, is rejected by God Almighty. And you know that you're born in iniquity. And all you have is this guilt right here. And you know where you're going. You're doomed to hell. This is the light that breaks forth in the morning. Thine health shall spring forth speedily. And thy righteousness, that's Christ's righteousness, is attributed to you, shall go, go before thee. You're going to see with new eyes Christ's righteousness. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Then shall thou call. <laughs> then shall thou call. When you see Christ's righteousness, this is the new call after a new heart. And the Lord shall answer, thou shall cry, and he shall say, here I am. <clears throat> For thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke to putting forth of the finger and speaking vanity. God will take away all the bondage, all the fear, all the yoke that you've been carrying since the fall of Adam. He's going to strip it right away when you see the righteousness of Christ is your firm foundation and your rest for your soul. This is authentic salvation. But those that cry are given to call and cry. It's not a work you do to get salvation. In the process of salvation, God opens your mouth. It's a new mouth. That's because you got a new heart and it came through the new ears and it's from the new eyes of seeing Christ as the righteous one. And that new mouth it's the Holy Spirit from within crying, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. And that's the use of the message. That's the renewing of the Holy Ghost. The new mind inside a, a, a new believer says, all I am is sin and iniquity. And all Christ is is perfect and righteous. I just pray God use that to save you.